Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense. To the fear you can hear. Relax and listen to the strange tale of a strange man. Though no more strange than anyone who has suffered what you might call a mutilation of the soul. And who of us has not, at one time or another, suffered such a mutilation? What means did we use to restore ourselves? How quickly did we recover? How well did we heal? The answers vary even as we vary. One man's answers are revealed, we trust, in the story which follows. I'm cold. So oh. am I. It's the darkness I mind the most. Oh. Not to be able to see you. Oh, touch me. That would help. My God, where are you? Right here. Right here. I can't find you. Keep, keep talking. Keep talking. Right here. Here. Right here. Here. Huh? Oh. here you are. Oh, darling. Don't let go. Never. Never. Our mystery drama, The Deadly Hour, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Norman Rose. I'll, I'll be back shortly with Act One. person who seems strange, we call grotesque, incredible, not to be believed. We make a feeble effort to deny that he could exist, but he does exist. There he is before our eyes in all his strangeness. We do not believe in him because we do not know him, because once we know, we will have to believe. And this can be a long and painful process. Listen now to the story of Martin Jerome. See if you can believe it. Mr. Jerome, I only consented to see you because your letter sounded quite desperate. As a rule, I only see patients on referral. But your letter, may I read it to you? Perhaps it will help us to get started. Last night, I heard you being interviewed on a radio program. In the dark of my room, in the darkest hour of the night, I thought, here is a man who can help me to solve the awful predicament in which I find myself. I enclose a stamped addressed envelope for your reply, since I have no phone. I am counting on you. Sincerely, Martin C. Jerome. Well, Mr. Jerome, uh, the hour is passing, and I don't want you to waste your money. Take your time. Take your time if you have difficulty in talking. I'll wait. Doctor. Did you say something, Mr. Jerome? Doctor, you... Yes. You are the first person I have spoken to in 25 years. You said... Twenty-five years? Yes. I begin to understand your silence. Can you tell me what drove you into this silence? I... I married a woman. Yes. The... The most desirable woman in the world. My Helen. My adored one. I never thought that an insignificant man like myself could even aspire to possess such a woman. And the day she said those words to me, I could scarcely believe my ears. You're a dear, Martin, and I'd love to marry you. Helen, I, I can't think why you'd want a man like me. Oh, because you're sweet. Let's get married right away. What about next week? The world changed completely for me. Everything became important, immediate. The sun shone just to keep me warm, and the breeze blew to make me cool. Me, Martin Jerome, me. I had been so 
so blessed. Yes, it was a beautiful wedding. Helen had a great deal of money and I was fairly well off. Many people came to the church and even more to the reception. People of prominence. I knew them all. All but one. He was tall. Unusually tall. As I am unusually short. He was handsome. As I am not. He was charming, self-assured, very much at his ease. All of which I have never been. You couldn't help noticing him. Helen, who's that very tall man talking to your mother? The pale man with the black mustache? I have no notion, love. It's probably someone mother invited. Good looking, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Sort of. Come on. Time to cut the cake. We sailed for Europe. My head was swimming with visions of the life I had embarked on. The good life, the beautiful life. One night on the ship, we were at dinner. Helen, look over there, to your right against the wall, sitting by himself. Isn't that the man who was at our wedding? Five hundred people at our wedding, love. He's getting up from the table. The tall man, black mustache. <laughs> your mother must have invited him, you said. Well, then I guess she did. After dinner, we danced for a while. Then headache, but I should stay and enjoy myself. Well, I, I tried, but I couldn't enjoy myself without her. I was too much in love for that. I watched the dancers for a while, drank a brandy. I managed to kill an hour, and then I went down to our stateroom. Helen wasn't there. When I stepped back out into the corridor, there she was, coming out of another stateroom about six doors from ours. Darling! You, you weren't in our room. I didn't know what to think. You said that you had a headache. I've been doing a little detective work. You were so anxious to know who the tall man was. Well, I found out. He's not precisely a friend. His mother came to the wedding and dragged him along. Helen, you were in his stateroom. Oh, I ran into him in the corridor, and he said to come in for a nightcap. <sighs> Let's go to bed. Our stateroom is much nicer than his, by the way. <laughs> We went to Paris. And then because she loved to ski, we went to St. Moritz. She was very good on skis. Effortless as a bird flying. I watched and watched and never got tired of watching. And then, one day, there he was again, the tall man. I've got to catch the ski toe. Wait for me. Helen. Helen, he's here. Who's here? The Mother? man from the wedding. The man from the ship. Oh, is he here? Oh, so he is. I'm off. Wait for me. After St. Moritz, we came back to the city and moved into an apartment. I went to work. We made friends. Helen grew lovelier every day. And she was her loveliest the day she told me that we would have a child. Tell me about that. Well, Helen was very, very lighthearted, very casual about the prospect. But I, I, yes. How did you feel? Well, it's, it's hard to tell you, Doctor. Oh, I know every man is, is what? Excited? Happy? I don't know, but... Well, I, I felt bowed down, Doctor. Actually crushed by my own good fortune. That a man like myself, so petty, so pitiable, should be given a child by a woman like Helen. Have you always thought of yourself as petty and pitiable? I have. Why? Because I am. Go on. I could scarcely concentrate on my work once I'd heard the good news. Helen was on my mind all the time. And one day, I, I suddenly couldn't bear being in the office, couldn't bear being anywhere except where she was. And I rushed home. I, I suppose you know what I found. I think you'd best tell me. I, I hurried to the bedroom, looking for her. I burst through the door. And in the bed, our bed, there he was... The man from the wedding. From the wedding, from the ship, from the ski tow. He... He looked at me, standing in the doorway. He said not a word, but his red lips smiled. And then... Well, then the bathroom door opened. And Helen took a step into the room. Helen, all scrubbed and fragrant. 
She was wearing something pink. I think it was made of lace. And she... Doctor, she smiled, too. While I stood in the doorway, she smiled. And then she said, Well, love, now you know. And the world rocked, and I felt as though I had died. But I hadn't. I was still standing there. Doctor, I've never... I've never told what I just told you to anyone before. Not to anyone? No. It wasn't simply grief that I felt. It it was my pride that had been destroyed. My marriage to Helen had built up a sort of pride. I thought, if she loves me, then I must be something. Oh, it is not a good thing, Doctor, to build your pride on what other people think of you. Or seem to think. No. No, it isn't. So I cleared out. That was 25 years ago. And I have not said a word to anyone until today. How have you lived? Well, I I had a business, import and export. I kept the business, but I dismissed my staff. I had the phone removed and made arrangements to conduct my affairs by mail. I took a one-room flat with a little kitchen... A bed, a chest of drawers, an easy chair with an ottoman. And to one side of the chair, my hi-fi stereo set and my records. To the other side, my books. After my work, I'd sit in my easy chair with my feet on the ottoman, listen to my records and read. Only writers who are dead, however. I'd read till about ten o'clock, eat a little something and go to bed. The next morning, go to work work all day and do the same thing all over again. No relaxation of any kind? No enjoyment? Or vacation in the summer. I shut down the office for two weeks and take my vacation. Where do you go? I... I take a train. Uh, two trains, actually, and a bus to a little town on the coast called Marsh Hills. You've probably never heard of it. I'm afraid I haven't. No one has. And there's no reason why anyone should. And you spend your two weeks in Marsh Hills? Oh, no. No, I I merely stable my horse there. You have a horse? About 15 miles from Marsh Hills, Doctor, close to the sea. There's a cave hollowed out of the rock by the waves. And when I get to Marsh Hills, I arrive every year on the same day. They they have my horse ready for me, and I I ride the 15 miles to the cave, and there I spend my vacation. In a cave? For two weeks, I walk. I canter my horse on the beach. I gather what edible herbs there are growing in the rocks. I I, I boil them. They're very tasty, really. And at the end of two weeks, I return my horse to the stable and take my bus and the two trains back to the city. And you've lived this way for 25 years. Oh, yes. But, uh, Doctor, last summer... Uh, Last summer, something happened. I arrived in Marsh Hills, as always. My horse was waiting for me, as always. And we started off at a walk for the cave by the sea. There is always a certain excitement when I begin to smell the sea. And I know that soon I shall be out of sight and sound of any human being. There will be only the sea, sun, the wind, and my cave. It is the most thrilling moment of the year for me. I suppose it's the only one. Soon I will have my solitude. At last, I'm on the sand. My horse feels the excitement as I do. I feel him extend himself. And as we round the last bend in the shoreline, I see it. I see it, my cave, my refuge. But, but last summer... I I pulled my horse up at the entrance to the cave. I sat listening to the rhythms of the ocean. And then, all at once, I heard a sound. A sound that I had never heard before in that deserted spot. And the sound, Doctor, was coming from inside my cave. Never. Never had I felt such anger. I was faint with hatred. I dismounted and I crept to the side of the cave where I knew it sloped to the ground. 
quietly climbed to the roof. I found a tiny chink in the stone, no more than an eighth of an inch wide. I put my ear to it. Beneath me, I heard laughter. <laughs> laughter and tender words and all the sticky, silly sounds that lovers make. Are you my girl? Oh, so much, your girl. Ah, uh, how much? This much. I can't hardly see how much is this much. It's too dark in this place. Then come here. Oh, oh darling, darling love. They were kissing. They were using my sacred sanctuary for lovemaking. I almost fell from the roof of the cave. I struggled to stay where I was, and my feet dislodged a shower of stones. What was that? Sounds like a rock slot. Yes, some rocks in front of the entrance. Lots of them. Hey, uh, maybe we'd better move them. Oh, we can still get out. Let's stay a little longer. I love this place. All right. I climbed down. My brain was on fire. My whole body was on fire. I had never felt such hatred as I felt then. Not since... Well, Doctor, you know when I've told you. I took hold of a big boulder. Yes... Yes, these skinny arms went round it. This puny body pushed it, pushed and shoved till it stood against the mouth of the cave, was tight against the mouth of the cave. I heard the voices of the lovers fainter now from inside. George, it's really dark, darker than before. Aaron, there's, there's no light at all. I had sealed them in. What is darkness? It is the state from which we emerge, and it is the condition to which we return. We come from the darkness of the womb, we leave for the darkness of the tomb. In between is light and life. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Marvin Jerome, 50 years old, has not uttered a single word to a living soul in 25 years. But now, in the office of an attentive psychiatrist, it seems the dear man can't stop talking. After I had pushed and shoved the big rock into the entrance to the cave, Doctor, I stood for a few seconds, panting from the exertion and oppressed by the silence. There was only the sound of the wind and the water. I thought of the lovers locked inside. What were they doing? What were they saying? I felt that I must hear their voices again, as though their words which had driven me near to madness were essential now to keep me sane. I scrambled back to the roof of the cave and put my ear once again to the narrow crack through which I could hear them. George, there was a little light before, now there's none. More rocks must have fallen. I didn't hear them. I heard something that didn't sound like rocks falling. Come on, we've, we've got to clear the entrance. Come where? I don't know where the entrance is anymore. It's so dark. Well, take my hand. I, I, I think I know which direction. I can't even see your hand. D don't you have a match? I, I, I may have. Boy. Yeah, yeah, I, I have a few. The light one. I, I will, I will. Oh, it went out. Now, don't panic, don't panic. Light another. We've got to get out of here. Just, just don't panic. All right, now, careful. Be careful. I am. I am being careful. Oh, oh, but darling. Huh? Now, I found the one that went out. It was right by my foot. Let me light it from yours. Yeah, good, good girl. Good girl. All right, George. That, that, there's the entrance. Don't let your match go out. Don't you let yours. Hey, look. See? Just a whole bunch of stones. Come on. Let's start clearing them away. Oh. Uh, both matches went out. That's all right. We, we know where we are. We're right by the entrance. Come on, let's get started. George. What, darling? 
We will get out, won't we? Of course, of course we'll get out. Now, keep working. Don't stop. At my listening post atop the cave, I heard them so kindly toward each other, so reassuring, so united in their purpose. I pressed my ear closer to the crack in the cave's roof. I was frantic to hear every word. George, it isn't getting any lighter. Shouldn't it start to get lighter? Yes, it should. Oh, why doesn't it? How should I know why? I'm, I'm sorry, darling. Oh, that's all right. Marion. What, what darling? We, we've cleared all the stones away. But there's no light. No. None. Why not? Why is it there? Because there's, there's something huge, a, 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 a big boulder, I, I, I think, up against the entrance. Oh, move it, move it. I will. It, it's heavy. It, oh, it must be huge. Well, how did it get there? It fell from someplace, Lord knows where. Can't you move it? I'm trying. Let me help. Put your shoulder up against it. That's what I'm doing. Can't you see? No, I can't see. Do you think I could? Can you see? I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me. All right, let's try together now. One, two, three. Jump! I... I don't think we moved it at all. No, no. Uh, Not a centimeter. Darling, uh, you know what the trouble is? Uh, We're tired, that's all. Clearing away all the stones just took our strength. I haven't had anything to eat since this morning. We need to rest for a little while. And then we'll be able to move it. Oh, you're probably right. So let's... Let's lie down right here by the entrance so we know where we are. First, I want to light a match. Why do you want to do that? I want to look at your face. Oh. <laughs> Light. This is the face I love. This. This is the face I love. It's dark again. No matter. When we wake up, we'll find our way into the light. Sleep now, my darling. The thought of them, lying there. No, the vision of them, for I could see them. The image was so strong. The two of them pressed close. Their arms entwined, their hands clasped. The two young bodies fitted so tightly together against the dark and the cold. The nameless memory crowded in on me. And I knew, I knew what it was I remembered and would not name. And it was... It was... Love. Love. It was love that I remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Doctor. For what? For, for crying like this. If there is anything to be sorry for... It's that it took you so long to cry. All I really know is that when that word came into my head... What word? The word, the word, the word love. I shrank from it as though it was tainted poison. Yes. And then? And then? Oh, then. Then, Doctor, I, I, I climbed down. I got on my horse and rode back to Marsh Hills. I took the bus and the two trains back to the city. You what? I opened up my office. I took the dust covers off the furniture in my flat, and I resumed my old routine. Didn't you... Didn't you ever think of... of them? I'd shut them out of my mind, just as I'd shut them in the cave. You didn't worry about them or... or anything? Well, they had each other. Mr. Jerome, I have to tell you, I'm... I can't help being... shocked... Forgive me. Go on. Well, after a while, the old feeling of loneliness came back. You see, I... I missed them. 
missed them? Yes, it may sound strange. Indeed it does. I began imagining what they might be saying to each other. I couldn't know for sure, of course, but I imagined. I'm cold. So am I. I'm hungry. I, I, I can't find you. Keep talking. Keep talking. I'm here. I'm here. I, 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 oh, oh, oh. oh, there you are. Oh, darling, don't let go. Oh, never. Never. I invented their conversations, of course, but I was fairly sure my inventions were accurate, or, or nearly so. You simply left them there mm. for two weeks. And then I was suddenly seized with the desire to hear their voices once more before, well, before they were silent forever. I closed the office, closed the flat, took the two trains and the bus to Marsh Hills. <laughs> they were surprised if the state were to see me back again so soon, of course, but they saddled my horse and I set off for the cave. The old excitement came back when I started to smell the salt air. There was the familiar thrill which I had looked forward to each summer for 25 years till they had invaded my kingdom by the sea. Such a tiny kingdom, a cave no bigger than a tool shed, with no comforts, no conveniences, and they had taken it away from me. Ah, on the sand at last, we run the last bend, and I see it. My cave, my refuge. And even from a distance, I can see that the big boulder still stands wedged into the entrance. What did you do then, Mr. Jerome? I, uh, I dismounted. I climbed to the roof of the cave. After all, I had made the long and rather arduous trip to hear their voices once more. If I could, I... I crouched down. I put my ear to the narrow crack. And were they still alive? Oh, yes. Yes. Weak, of course, but alive. Oh, yes, they were still alive. Are you all right, George? Yes. Are you? I'm all right. If we only had something to eat... Anything. <laughs> Don't think about it. You think there's any use trying to move that big rock again? No. I guess you're right. Well, we've got about a third of the energy we had to start with. We... Let us save whatever we've got. Save it for what, George? I don't know. I know. For when somebody finds us, it's possible, isn't it, for somebody to find us? Of course. Oh, George, I'm thirsty. Can you find the place where that trickle of water runs down the side? I think so. Feel along the cave wall to your right. It's so, so black in here. You, you should be there by now. Light the match. No, it's the only one we have. George, wasn't there a sort of a, a ridge, a, an indentation where the water trickled down in some moss? That's right. Well, I... I think I found it. Oh, good. There's no water. There must be. There isn't. Then you're in the wrong place. Then you find it. You're so smart. I know exactly where it's... About here, I remember this... It... It ought to be right here. Yes, I it ought to be, but it isn't. It ought to be, but it isn't. Marion, Marion, shh, shh, shh. No food. Now there's no water. Shh, shh, shh. Doctor, I wanted to call to them. I wanted to say, wait for rain. Because as soon as a good rain came, the water would start to trickle down the cave wall again. But I couldn't speak. I don't know why I, I couldn't. Do you? I have some notion, yes. Why couldn't I? 
I'd rather you told me the rest of the story first. All, all right, Doctor, if you say so. Well, they must have gone to sleep after that. I think they probably slept a lot. I, I know that I didn't hear anything more after that until much later. I wonder what day it is. Uh, it was Saturday when we came down here, wasn't it? Yes. Well, it must be, uh... uh I, 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 I don't know. We've been here a week, I think. Uh, more than that. Much more? About a week and a half. Oh. You think it's Wednesday? Or... Uh, I... Yeah, I, 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 I think so. If it's Wednesday, then we've been here... 11 days. Something like that. What difference does it make? I'd just like to know, that's all. Oh, don't be angry, darling. Doctor, I have the craziest impulse to whisper to them. It's Tuesday. I almost laughed. Why do these... Ludicrous ideas come into our heads at the weirdest moments of our lives. Perhaps it wasn't as ludicrous as you thought. Well, of course it was. I was there to watch these people die. Listen to them die is more like it. And I still wanted to tell them what day of the week it was. If that's not ludicrous, I don't know what is. Tell me, what happened next? Oh, I went to sleep on the roof of the cave... After the sun came up in the morning, I got a sandwich out of my saddlebag and a flask of brandy and sat on the sand for a while, watching the ocean. And then I went back to my listening post. George. Yes? I'm going to try walking around a little. Oh, Lord. This darkness is driving me mad. No, it's not. No, it's not. Let me have a match. No. Oh, give it to me. I won't. What was that? I heard something. I stumbled over something. Well, look, 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 look for it. The fish are That's around. That's what I'm doing. Got it. Well, what is it? Uh, feels like a little sort of a pan. Pan? Oh. It, well, about four, f five inches wide. What? Enamel, I think. Feels like enamel. It's a little pan to cook things in, the sort of thing campers might use. Wait, wait, that, that, that means somebody's been here before. And that means whoever was here could come back. Or somebody else could. I, I, I mean, this cave is a place people come to. We're, we're not the only ones. We're not the first. Other people have... They'd stumbled across the little enamel pan I had used to boil my herbs. I couldn't bring myself to speak to them, but... I took a packet of matches, the cardboard kind, and I wrote on it, I am here. Just that. I am here. And, and I slipped it through the crack in the roof of the cave. <laughs> here. I suppose the most cherished trio of words in our language consists of I love you. But surely there are times of trouble when I am here is even more welcome. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. of not listening, the malady of not marking, that I am troubled with all. So said Henry IV, according to William Shakespeare. But the disease that troubles Martin Jerome is listening too closely, and his malady is marking too well. I pushed the packet of matches with its absurd message down through the crack in the cave with a little stick. I heard it drop. I knew it had reached them, even before I heard Marion speak. George. Huh? 
Something just dropped onto my shoulder. George, light the match. Mary, it's our last match. I don't care, light it. I have to know what fell on my shoulder. I, I, I don't like to use George, up our last... please, if you don't, I'll... All, all right, all, all, all right. T take, it, take it easy. Did you see anything? It hit my shoulder and then it... There it is. George! Well, it's matches. It's a whole fold of matches. You're kidding. I'm not. There's something written on it here, George. Wait a minute. It says, I am here. Who? Who, who is, who's here? I don't know. I, 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 oh, my God. That's the end of the match. I held it till I burned my fingers. I'm sorry. I couldn't. <laughs> All right. Well, we have matches now. Can you see? It, it, it isn't signed at all. It just no. says, I am here. But that's all. But who, who, who's here? It doesn't matter, does it? Somebody's here. That, 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 that's what counts. So why doesn't he say something? Call out to us or something. Tell us that everything will be all right. Maybe, maybe he's going for help. Oh, yes, that must be. Yes. That, that, that is it. it it's, it's all right now. It, it's all right as, as long as somebody's here. I couldn't stand their joy over my simple-minded message. They seemed like silly children, as silly as I felt myself. But I hadn't the faintest notion what I was going to do once I had made this strange contact with them. I climbed down and sat on the beach staring at the water until I fell asleep. I must have slept the rest of that day and all night because it was the sun coming up behind the horizon that woke me. I went back to the cave, climbed to the roof, and put my ear to the crack. George, I can't stand it. Where is he? How should I know? Stop asking me. He wouldn't give us a message like that. He wouldn't write. I am here on a package of matches and then just go away, would he? How do I know you keep asking me as though I had an answer? I'm not hungry anymore. I haven't been hungry for a long time. I just feel terribly weak. Damn it, I know. I know. Now, will you shut up? Just shut up. We'll die here, George. Be quiet. No water. No food. Oh, we'll die here. I said shut up. Whoever wrote that note must have been a madman. Whoever he was, wherever he was, he's gone away. Yes. And we'll die in this cave. I don't intend to die in this cave. No. And just what do you think you'll do about it? Something. Nothing you can do. I'm just not going to die. Yes. Not yet. Yes. You are. Make up your mind to it. What are you doing now? I'm going to light a match. Match? <laughs> we have matches. No food. No water. Just matches. George, what? I'm not going to die. Not yet. Not me. George! Not me. I felt as though the world had stopped. Actually, I had stopped. All at once, I knew what I must do. Must do. I didn't want to go completely out of my mind. I clambered down from the roof. I ran to the cave entrance. I tried to move the big boulder that blocked it. I knew even before I tried that I wouldn't be able to do it. But my mind was working brilliantly. I ran to where my horse's saddle and bridle lay on the sand. And after taking it all apart, I began working to put it together again for a new purpose. Oh, I used everything. The girth, the reins, the stirrup leathers. And in an hour, I had fashioned a crude device... I led my horse to the cave entrance. Somehow I wrapped the girth around the boulder and made it firm. The rain circled my horse's shoulders. And then I stood back and gave him a sharp rap on the flank. He moved. And the boulder moved. 
the boulder moved away from the entrance to the cave. There was room for me to squeeze through. Just inside, I found them. She lay there in a faint. He lay across her. And his teeth... His teeth were sunk in her breast. <laughs> Mr. Jerome, would you like to wait till another time to tell me? That? No, no, no. I, I must, I must tell it to you now. I, I, I carried their bodies out and I put them on the back of my horse. I, I threw a halter over his head and led him the 15 miles to Marsh Hills. It took all day because I stopped every hour to be sure that they were both breathing. There's a doctor in Marsh Hills, and I, I left them on his doorstep. I, I rang his bell and fled. The next day, I waited outside the doctor's house until I saw an ambulance drive up and take the young couple away. They were able to walk, so I, I knew they were all right, or, or soon would be. I, I went back to the city, but not before I had memorized the name of the hospital, which was printed on the ambulance. And from the city, I wrote to the hospital. I, I pretended to be a concerned relative. They answered me. They said that the girl, Marion, had already been discharged, but that they were keeping the young man for a few days more. They would let me know when he could go home. And they did let me know. I remember it was, uh, it was on a Sunday. And as he walked out of the hospital, I, I was waiting for him. Well, he didn't seem at all surprised to see me. I, 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 I took his hand. He came with me quietly. Uh, we boarded the bus. We took the two trains, no trouble at all. And when we got to the city, we, um, we uh, went to my flat. Uh, he undressed bathed and got into my bed and and he went to sleep <sighs> that was uh oh six months ago doctor and he's been there with me ever since he's he's all right oh he's very well uh i sleep on the floor now uh he sleeps in the bed I cook his breakfast, come home from the office and cook his lunch. And, of course, I, I make dinner for us both at night. And, uh, oh, we listen to music. I read a book, but he, well, he, um, just listens to the music. Oh, yes, yes, he's in, in good health. Mr. Jerome, the hour is up. You want me to leave? Not quite yet. You've told me an amazing story. As amazing a story as I've ever heard. But tell me, just what is it you expect of me? What do you want me to do for you? Huh? Oh, why? Why, nothing, Doctor. Nothing? Nothing at all? I, I don't want help for myself, Doctor. I, I want help for the young man. You see... In the six months he's been staying with me, he hasn't uttered a word. Not one word. Go see the doctor, young man. Yes, George. He can help you to unburden yourself. He will make the words pour out in full confession and you will feel the better for it. Why, look. Look what he has just done for Martin Jerome. As the deadly hour passed. I'll be back shortly. You heard of the seven wonders of the world? The Grand Canyon, the Taj Mahal, Niagara Falls... Uh, and I forget the other four. No matter. Because they are simple things compared to the human mind. In all its deviousness, all its twists and drifts. Why, well, I could sit in wonder at the human mind for the rest of my life. 
Our cast included Norman Rose, Marion Seldes, John Barragray, and Jack Grimes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. That's impossible. Why is it impossible? It's all right for the simple-minded hicks up here to swallow that superstitious nonsense, but me, I'm a doctor. There has to be a reasonable, logical, rational explanation for what happened to George Morrissey. Well, there is, there is. He offended the spirit of the mountain. Oh, you consider that reasonable, logical, rational? Would you feel better if I said there's something up in that mountain, a virus, a bacillus, a fungus, which somehow causes immediate aging? It would be a more rational explanation. <laughs> you mean more acceptable. I want to know what you believe. I believe the evidence. If you go up there, you can die. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>